Welcome to our session, Meet the Technical Advisory Board and the Core Developers. I made some slides with the Dean's help, and the Dean made some slides and sent them. And the first slide is to introduce the TAB members, several of whom were recently elected. Myself, Sean Davis, Adine, Casper Hansen, Mike Love, Levi Waldron, Davide Riso, Sheila Gazanfar, Stephanie Hicks, Lori Kern, Charlotte Sonneson, Laurent Gatto, Raphael Rizari, Robert Gentleman, and Wolfgang Huber. I don't know how many of them are on board, but a good number of them are. And so we welcome your questions and your comments. Those who wish to be involved with the Technical Advisory Board can do this by joining a working group. The working group's website is listed on the slide, workinggroups.bioconductor.org, and you can suggest and or lead a new working group, and the TAB will be engaging with you to see how we can learn about what you've proposed and help you accomplish the aims of the working group. There is a Slack channel called uh, hashtag technical advisory board that can be used to contact the entire board. And there's also any of the members that we've listed before can be contacted to discuss issues related to the technical functionality of Bioconductor. We also have self-nominations and um, other nomination processes that occur every year around May. And uh, we try to keep the community abreast of this so that individuals who are deserving of participation in the Technical Advisory Board can be elected to that board. <clears throat> Our purpose is to develop strategies to ensure the long-term suitability of core infrastructure for the bioconductor mission. That's one of our purposes. And so value to the scientific community is something we need to be aware of. We need to understand the overall population of the ecosystem with packages, how it's managed. We do work on end user engagement, approaches to documentation and the web and the support site. And we do developer support and documentation. And the TAB does advise uh, on package that should be used by the developer community. We also are engaged in the pursuit of uh, funding strategies for long-term viability of the project. We have monthly meetings on the first Thursday of every month, and the minutes are posted after each meeting. We'll get into the minutes in a moment to see some examples. Uh, one aspect of membership in the TAB is that individuals who have funding that is used to operate the project uh, become members of the TAB. I'm one of those. And the aims that we wrote for March 2021 are maintain availability and growth of the ecosystem, enhance reliability and performance of the genome analysis infrastructure components with improved formal testing and modernization of our build system, which is operating every day to build all packages nominally. Aim three was to advance development of genomic methods that leverage cloud scale computing and data service paradigms. I spoke a bit about some of those ideas in the opening session. And then to enhance education and community engagement processes that have been intrinsic to the project. The TAB governance allows membership of grant principal investigators, and the use of the funds has to do with dealing with the balance between community contributions, which are not developed by the core, and the service project infrastructure packages and the deep stack that I have named in the past few years that is maintained by the core that makes the ecosystem a unified and um, highly effective tool for a very large uh, participating scientific community. The core developers are here. 
Nitesh, Marcel, Hervé, Jen, Lori, and Alex. And I talk to the core members every week. And this is a hard to see, but this is just a slice of the Trello board at this point, uh, describing uh, various things that have to be taken care of. Um, I don't really want to get into the topical structure because if you move this board a bit, you'd start to see things that are a little more uh, topical. But um, this is one way that the core devs manage their activities. Now, the minutes of the tab meetings are available at bioconductor.org, and they are under the About tab at the top of the uh, bioconductor.org web address site. And this is an example of um, some minutes. So for example, uh, we do have a rotating schedule of brief presentations to the TAB. And last month we had uh, Rafa Irizari and Nitesh Buraga speaking about aspects of improving bioconductors activities in the single cell biology field. And also um, the system that is used to build package binaries, which are extremely useful in containerized analysis environments. And the nature of the discussion there uh, is in those bullet points. Uh, going through these minutes is uh, quite instructive uh, for getting a sense of the scope of the project, things that you don't often see. Um, it, it's a very, um, it's usually a meeting that we all look forward to because we are rather far flung. We have people from Europe. We sometimes have an attendee from, from Asia and people all over the country here get a chance to meet and uh, see what's going on in the project, which has to have a new release every six months. So there really isn't a, a great deal of opportunity to strategize before a new, a new release. So here's a use case uh, where we really need to have a broad input from TAB members and from core developers to deal with this really important asset called the, the books, the monographs. I hope many of those who are listening uh, are familiar with these, uh, orchestrating single cell analysis, uh, the single R book and the seesaw book are um, really very nicely integrated and tested uh, software um, collections with all kinds of narrative prose that make them monographs. And the maintenance of these uh, things, uh, which are living on top of a, um, you know, a constantly changing ecosystem involving both bioconductor and CRAN packages, uh, is, is delicate. And what we can see now is that in the DEVEL branch, four uh, chapters of the OSCA book are throwing errors. And we know why they're throwing errors, and it is a package that is, um, you know, needs some maintenance. It's not a core package. The authors of the book are not in control of that package. They may need to change the, pack, the, the book so that it doesn't use that package if the package authors do not fix it. And um, this is just an example of the kind of um, work that has to be done by the TAB and the core to keep key assets of the ecosystem functioning. And those are the, that is the end of the slides. I hope I have explained uh, enough of the TAB and the dev core activities so that we have time for comment and question. Is someone watching the um, chat? Chat's quiet. Chat is quiet. Vince, a quick question. Yes. You may have said that, but you may repeat pretty much. Those meetings, monthly meetings for TA, are they closed meetings or? Yeah, the, the meetings are. Uh, closed to the TAB and to the, um, the the core developer group. 
Um, I don't know that we've ever had much discussion of whether they could be uh, more open. It's usually a pretty packed agenda, um, but I'd open discussion uh, on that topic to other members of the TAB if they have thoughts about that. At the same time, you mentioned that you provide minutes. The minutes are available very uh, rapidly after the uh, calls. <clears throat> All the minutes for um, both boards, the CAB and the TAB, are posted on uh, their respective pages off the main bioconductor page in the About section. There's a page for each board, and the minutes are on those pages from each meeting. I would say if anyone um, from the community felt strongly that they had a topic to address with the TAB or the CAB, to reach out, like on the Slack or so one of the members, because there's been occasions on both boards where we do have like guest presenters or guest topics if it was something of interest that they felt needed to be addressed with boards. Um, so there's always that option too if um, people had a concern that they wanted to raise. People have questions about the core of the tab. The core advisory board is different from the community advisory board, or it isn't? There isn't a core advisory board. There are core developers. Um, and um, we have a what can I say? We work from release to release for the most part. Uh, and there are ideas that come up, for example, advancing containerization, producing binaries so that anyone who's using a container does not have to go through compilation process, but can simply use a binary repository with BioC Manager install to get much more rapid uh, inclusion of new packages into a working containerized uh, environment. Um, those are examples of the kinds of things that crop up, you know, when, when technology uh, affords new approaches, core devs may decide to experiment and do something that changes the way the core works. For example, you know, Lori is now researching GitHub Actions to see how that could, that technology could be mobilized to affect uh, some of the things we do when we ingest new contributions, for example. So I didn't show, and perhaps I should, I thought I had, in fact, I think I showed this in the opening uh, session, but um, if we take a look at the new contributions, this is a major part of the work of the core, which is to deal with the fact that people want to have new contributions into the ecosystem. And here's a good example of one which may have rather significant ramifications uh, because it, it uses Rust, and we do not have any Rust-using packages in Bioconductor yet. Um, so that means that all the platforms now have to be uh, refreshed to have all the necessary runtimes for Rust compilation. And um, I don't consider it a bump in the road, but it's something that certainly wasn't planned for. And, um, you know, another thing that we need to do is um, understand the flow of software into the system through the ingestion process, through the build system, to error or success states over time. Uh, because oftentimes when you see something like the errors that I showed you with respect to the books, it is not immediate to understand the cause of the error. You see an event, it's, it's linked to some function in some package, but that doesn't mean that, that fixing that function in that package is gonna make the error go away. Okay. It, yeah. 
So please, yeah, please go on. So yesterday there was some discussion about, for example, once a package is accepted into Bioconductor, it's a very rigorous review process to certify the developers have complied with the usual standards for documentation, for examples, for a runnable substantial vignette. Now, every so often something kind of sneaks through or re perhaps regresses a little bit uh, as versions are bumped and so forth. And one of the package developers mentioned that this was somewhat distressing because it, it, it kind of deteriorates the, the, the trust of the bioconductor brand, if you will. And my reply to that was that it, it's a huge project and it's an ongoing it's an ongoing discussion how to scale this up so that it doesn't crush the core developers in terms of review. Because with thousands of packages, it's simply not feasible above and beyond running build every on every version bump to handle this. But it, it does seem to be sort of a live problem that crops up every now and then. Um, is this something where the working groups for the community advisory board are really the, the tip of the spear for that? Are there, you just meant, when you brought up the build system, and how difficult it can be to keep all of the different uh, build platforms up to date for, um, I guess, the single package builder, the SPB, uh, is the successor to the to what used to be a nightly rebuild everything. Uh, good part of it, no? It's only for the ingestion process. The single package builder is used in on demand. The nightly builds and checks still occur. Those are independent. Um, it's just, it's a different process. So we use the same builders in the single package builder to try to mimic the daily environment as much as possible in the review process, but those daily builders are still there. And Vince, maybe you could take it them to where those, because I think a lot of people don't know where the daily build checks are, so that might be a good thing to show too. So once a package is accepted, it moves into the daily nightly build where it still gets installed, built, and checked. There's just no bio C check run on accepted packages. It's the standard R install, R command build, R and check that's run on every package. So I think, uh, yeah, if, if I understood Tim's question, uh, it has to do with the fact that while we do quality control for an ingested package to get into the system, there is no control on what the developer does subsequently to that. If they break, the, they can remove things. It, 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 they have agreed, let's say, that the API should not change without a deprecation cycle. So things should not come out, but we cannot verify that. We see it sometimes and then ask people to obey the, the rule that they agreed to. Uh, but your point is correct that um, functionalities can change in release or in devel, and um, all we have is really this. So if they have changed it in such a way that the package is still showing green, uh, we don't have any reason to intervene. I'll push back a little bit, and having been a package developer who depended on something that was deprecated, and I had quite a struggle getting to the point where I could replace it one-to-one, -one, the triage and deprecation process is real. You know, as fire conductor standards rise, sometimes the package will be squeezed out when the developer doesn't have time to or refuses to update it. So, Lori, I have interacted on that process, in fact. So, I will push back to say that it's not that there's no quality control, and there's no process for it, but it, it's a heavy lift for a package with thousands, uh, or a project with thousands of packages. And I'm wondering if there's a path forward for this or a degree of trust that once you're in, you're not going to start misbehaving. Well, like I, I, th I think I think to say that there's nothing that there's daily checks every single night and every single package to make sure that they're actually working with at least not failing and if they fail they get deprecated. I think what, but they, then you're relying, I think, on the community to make sure as well that the packages like well things like standards for a compiling vignette that's part of the build that sort of serves as a. a not a unit test, but a functional test uh, of competence, if you will, or a fit for, for purpose test. Sometimes people will post a vignette off of the bioconductor site and then won't compile it. Now, I've seen this get shot down in a review, so I know that on ingest, the standards are very high. But sometimes, as time goes by, this kind of creeps in. 
I don't know to what extent. I find it important, but I was surprised that one of the actual bioconductor um, developers, not core, but a developer with multiple active packages, felt that this was an issue that needed to be raised. So I figured I'd, I'd bring it up. Well, I think Laurie's starting up the you know, working group to actually examine some of these, like the triage group. So I think that if that's something that you're interested in, like, like let Laurie know, because I think she'd love to have extra people helping. Uh, I can attest that the triage, per, per, the triage process works as intended by squeezing out of packages that I didn't escalate the standards to meet bioconductors. So I, I, I... Yeah, and I want the working group, so I'm not the only bad guy in bioconductors. <laughs> <laughs> Most, most time, I'm the bad news bearer of bioconductor right now, uh, since I'm doing that. And it does get overwhelming for release. And I, admittedly, I haven't done it as much this release cycle because I've been tied down with other things, which is why I thought I would kind of pass it off to try to be a new working group. Um, I will say, too, I think it's been discussed both in the TAB and the core. We haven't necessarily implemented yet, and we're still trying to figure out how to do it, right? Because as you mentioned, there's thousands of packages, right? I think we have over 2,000 packages, and we do install build check on all of them, which is already um, a heavy load and a heavy strain on the build systems and um, resources that we have. Um, we run BioC check on incoming packages, which does a lot of those specific bioconductor checks, like having runnable examples in the vignettes and everything. Um, we just don't have the resource power to add that in across 2,000 packages. I think it's kind of been discussed and maybe this is a good point to bring it up again of either having like a separate system that just runs BIOC check-in, not necessarily as an enforcer, but kind of a snapshot of where packages are with regards to the BIOC check since we don't run it. Um, I think BIOC check was also introduced, I mean, it hasn't been around forever, right? So that was introduced later on. So we have the standard install build and check from R because that has been. Um, so it might be something that we can kind of consider or look into doing maybe as a secondary. It probably wouldn't necessarily be as enforceable for like deprecation, but it would definitely flag us to additional things that were more strict on on submission. Um, we just have to figure out a good way to do it uh, resource-wise. I have a question. Do we have any upcoming changes that will be happening in the next release or so that we want to talk about? Oh, well, um, I guess the problem is we are still using master as the default branch name for all the bioconductor Git repos. And um, yeah, it is our intention to change that. I think the candidates now are there will be a develop branch and a, and a release XYY branch. And that renaming process, I think we are capable of automating. And there's been a fair amount of discussion of how to do that. And the actual event is not yet dated, as far as I know. Does anyone on the core have a speculation about the Data which that could be carried out before 3.16 is released, for example. I don't know if Airbay's on here virtually, but I know Airbay would like to start it as close to after a release as possible, so that we would have the full release to get developers used to and working with the renaming. Okay. So I don't know if he's on or not, but I know Airbay's push would be like as close to or immediately following the next release as possible. <clears throat> okay. At least from my understanding, from maybe sooner, maybe a little later, but sometime in October or, or, I think that's what we're shooting for. Yeah. There's, there's a comment from uh, someone online asking if people would introduce themselves when, when they spoke, because people aren't sure who's, who anyone is. Mm -hmm. What did they see? I am Laurie. I've been talking a lot. 
<laughs> can, can, can you see us? Yes. Uh, I think there are some of you who are out of field of the camera, but it seems like we can see most people. Do you want me to like physically reorient the camera on AD? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm AD. Vince, Mark, mm -hmm. AD, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> I think someone is maybe it's talking, but oh, I'm talking. I'm Jen. I'm a member of the core team, <laughs> but um, I was the one who asked the question about what we're planning to do um, uh, around the next release or after the next release. So people aren't scared about that too. I, I, part of the delay, besides you know, crossing our T's and dotting our I's, is to make sure. I think Jen, Natasha, everyone is kind of um, aware that we'll need to like update and have good documentation for maintainers throughout this process and throughout this switch. So we're really trying to make sure that um, all the the pieces are in place for a smooth transition for that. Again, Laurie. So what I've done now is put onto the screen uh, a, a little more of our Trello boards. And um, just to give a little more information on some of the broader topics that we'd like to fold into our work the uh, BBS activities, the Bioconductor Build System, and this is Vince speaking, um, it has always seemed to me that we would like to have a database where we record for historical investigation uh, the state of the different packages on different platforms uh, as builds occur. We have a number of pieces of hardware that we own or that we rent and a catalog of them and a dashboard that uh, identifies their state, their uptimes, and so forth, uh, is needed. We have storage in many different uh, environments. And again, a dashboard that shows how it's being consumed, when we might run out of space, and so forth, is um, something I'd like to see done uh, this release, if possible. We are distributing data in many different ways data being software packages, binaries, uh, experiment data, annotation data. And um, it can be expensive when there are egress charges involved. Uh, we do not have a requester pays um, approach for anything. And so um, there's uh, what I would call um, forensics that must be conducted when it seems that there's a, a site that is pulling data uh, um, robotically that they don't actually need and, and driving up our costs. We have done some of that. Martin did that a year ago or so. Um, we want to be able to bring new core members on when we have resources to do this. And so there needs to be a cookbook describing all of the activities. We have pretty good documentation in that respect. Um, the Git branch renaming we've just discussed. There are maintenance activities for the single package builder. Uh, workshop orchestrator, uh, that's something that Sean Davis has contributed that is used in the conference. We also have another um, implementation of that concept by Alex. And there's a lot of work in Kubernetes. I think there's need for more expertise in the group to grow uh, in understanding container orchestration and what it can do for the uh, deeper activities of the project with respect to compilation and management of the whole ecosystem. So there's a lot for the core to do, and the TAB uh, may be interested in some of these and may wish to express desires of prioritization uh, among those many activities. And um, it's a lot. So when community members get involved and, and help us to solve problems, uh, or to um, reduce the number of problems, uh, it is much appreciated. If, 
we should probably mention just about grants and things like that. That um, if people are, this is Aideen. Um, yeah, so if people are interested in applying for funding, whether it be from NIH or CCI or any other organization, and whether that's to support Bioconductor at the community level, at the technical level, or just to help integration of packages, um, where the people in Bioconductor are very, very keen to help um, community members get funds to help the whole project grow. So please do contact us. We can help you with that application. We can um, write you a letter of support. Uh, Alex. Yep. See, this is uh, this is the one core member that that I'm still getting the name wrong. Um, do you want to introduce yourself to, to the folks that are joining virtually? Sure. Oh, uh, I'm Alex. I joined in December. I'm the newest core team member. Uh, yeah, I do uh, most of the, so far uh, like cloud things, Kubernetes things. Yeah. How's that going? Good. No, I, I love the community. I like the core team. Um, I came from the Galaxy project, so I've been in like open source, open science, biology sphere uh, for a few years now. Uh, yeah, one of the projects that we've been working on is uh, with the uh, Yes for Cure program at Dana Farber. Uh, it's a program for. Uh, junior in high school to junior in college students. Um, we did a cancer data science chat. Uh, so I made kind of a pipeline to go from RMB files to Python notebooks and automatically applied it to this Galaxy instance. So using uh, GitHub Actions to automate the whole process where somebody can make a change to an RMB file and it gets propagated to a live instance and students come here they launch notebooks. It takes about 30 seconds for the notebook to come up, and then they can do the course and submit it back to us. Um, and yeah. Uh, should we give a background on what Cure is? Yeah. So that it's not the Seattle Children's Hospital. <laughs> um, Cure in this instance is it's actually an NIH program and the SADIN. Um, for underrepresented minorities. And so it's a program for high school students and also for undergraduates who come from underrepresented minorities and to encourage them to get involved in, um, in, in cancer research. So we were talking with the Cure Group at Dana-Farber, um, Vince and myself, and um, we recognized that whilst they had a program to recruit um, underrepresented minority students into the lab, wet lab research. They didn't really have anything in bioinformatics and they really recognized this with, with COVID recently. So this project is to encourage, um, like uh, to provide a route, I suppose, into cancer research and bioinformatics for students. And so they recruit quite a lot of um, from local um, high schools and from universities where there is more ethnic diversity. It's fantastic. I, I mentored a young woman at the uh, Regeneron STS program. She approached me and if, if, I, if, if this had existed when we were working together, I mean, she did quite well. She's at Stanford now, but I, I, I would have given anything for something like this to, to be able to pass on directly. This is phenomenal. Yeah. Well, Alex uh, really made the uh, a lot of um, bridge work uh, to to make this happen. Uh, you know, we're talking about our markdown. I think one of the things we really want to accomplish is uh, helping people to author effective teaching materials and to make them available for computation as as quickly as possible. So you write an R markdown, put it in a package, and then 
uh, the, the, the steps required to put it in a system of this type are really very, uh, very simple. Uh, so this is just, you know, a, an idea of, you know, could we, could we move this framework into other topic areas in genomic data science and for other, you know, student populations and so forth? Uh, I think it is very viable. Uh, thanks to this kind of work. I thought a first year grad, or a first year grad uh, student took a course this year with really where something like this. If I you know, if I'd had access to an expertise with it, it made my life a thousand times easier. So this is this is pretty terrific. Yeah. Let, let's keep in touch because we should write this up and and get more people to use these types of. We have an RT R twenty five that submitted this sort of thing with the development for it specifically for DEI. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And this infrastructure is running on the Jetstream cloud at Indiana University. So it's not on one of the commercial clouds. So the infrastructure is free and service units instead of actually paying a company for money. Oh. And I'm also, I guess, managing the open storage network. We also got an allocation there. Um, and we got an AWS open data in collaboration with the Galaxy project. So we have a bucket where Amazon is just paying for the egress fees for us, uh, and that bucket is in Sydney. So we have the open storage network in the US and then the AWS open data bucket in Sydney, both egress free places where we can put data. Um, and, and we just got that a few months ago, so slowly transitioning things to use that more. Have students been enrolled in this yet, or when is the first batch of students? Yeah, we started three weeks ago. Yeah, we um, gave a talk to 100 people and 11 decided to register for this. That's pretty good. Done four meetings, yeah. And are they each doing different projects? And is this the training? Is this the, the, the through the year training program that they're doing? Okay, so this is getting a little off topic. Sorry. I'll, this is I'll data stop. science. They all have their own work in wet labs and so forth. So it was just bringing them into yeah. a data science scope. It's 9.45, and I think we are due to end. Yeah. Uh, so I really thank uh, everyone who turned out, and I hope dialogue between us and others who are interested in the TAB and the core will continue. Any other final parting comments? Questions? Don't be afraid to ask us questions and don't be afraid when the call goes out for new members to boards to apply because we really want to diversify and get more people in. Um, and we would really encourage people if you're interested in getting involved, get involved. Don't be intimidated too. Yes, absolutely. Welcome. Does Levi or Charlotte want and to say something? Maybe I'll just add that you also don't have to wait to be a member of the board to to get involved. That 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 we want to have activities going on outside of the the board meetings uh, in the form of working groups, and and you can become involved in that at any time. Um, so if there's something that you have in mind or you see something on the working groups page uh, that interests you, please get in touch and, and get involved. And that's a good way to make yourself known to the people on the board and, and to meet people and contribute to the project. Sure. Right. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> but I'm not moving. All right, then I had it backwards. I thought I had to run across the street. All right, so I'm going to head over to JMB and try and make sure it is you know, with lightning bugs. If anything goes wrong, it's yep. going to be fine. So, Anything I think is over there. Yeah. All right, terrific. I hope.